All right. Well, if you're just now joining us, welcome. And if you've been here, welcome back. And this is Science Under the Stars. We are that grad student run organization trying to practice giving talks, give some outreach, and hopefully in the fall, some tours out at BFL when we're back in um, back in normal, normal circumstances. Uh, tonight, is, like I said, is our last Science Under the Stars talk for the semester, and we'll resume again in the fall. Uh, tonight, we are going to be hearing from Brianna Betke. Uh, she is in the Lauren Myers lab, and then she is also co-advised by Daniel Bolnick. Is that still true, Brianna? You guys still co-advised? Awesome, too. So two pretty high-powered scientists, so this should be fun. Uh, Brianna's interest, or not usually, but she's interested in how animals live in cities and if there are differences in disease prevalence across different levels of urbanization. And so she's currently working on uh, flea-borne diseases in humans and opossums in urban and rural areas of Texas, which is pretty cool. She also hails from us from Tucson, Arizona. And in the quarantine, she picked up a, a very, very healthy reading habit, which is kind of awesome. I think most of us have, but one of her favorite books, we were, we were briefly chatting, is Will Cats, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs by Caitlin Dowdy. So if you are looking for a book to read, Brianna highly recommend it. But if not, that's all right. And Brianna is going to be talking to us today about urban mammals. So this lines up really well with her research. So it should be an excellent talk. So Brianna, whenever you're ready, please share your screen and we're ready to listen. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm glad that we talked about, well, my cat eat my eyeballs. Um, it's a really interesting book. It, it takes children's questions about um, death and actually gives realistic answers to them about like, will your cat actually eat your eyeballs if you pass away? It's very morbid, um, but if you do read it, I had a lot of fun reading it. Uh, so I will share my screen. That always takes a second. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? All good, Brianna. Cool. Okay. Uh, so thank you again for coming out to see this talk or getting on your computers to see this talk. I know some of my family members aren't uh, well versed in using Zoom, so I I thank them for taking the time to figure that out. Um, so. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about urban mammals. Uh, they became an interest of mine as a high school student in Tucson. Um, I volunteered at a wildlife rehabilitation center and that really introduced me to urban wildlife. I started noticing all the animals around me and the neighborhood I lived in and I wanted to understand more about our interactions with them. So I went to the University of Arizona to study wildlife conservation and management and then I came here to UT to understand more about uh, disease ecology in wildlife and humans. And my high school actually had an event called Science Under the Stars, but it wasn't uh, a monthly thing like this. Uh, so with that, let's talk about cities. So a lot of people live in cities and we're expecting more people to. There we go. 80 or 68 percent of the world's population is expected to live in urban areas by 2050, compared to the 55 percent in 2018. And in the U.S. alone, it's estimated that 83 percent of the population uh, live in urban areas. Uh, one state in particular that has a lot of growing cities is Texas. So 15 of uh, 15 of the fastest growing cities. Six of them are in Texas. I know some of my Arizona family might notice a couple of cities as well, Buckeye, Arizona, and Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, but for Texas, the number one city that has the fastest growing population between 2010 and 2019 is Frisco, Texas. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly, but that's located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, and some of these other cities you might notice that are part of the Austin metropolitan area, like Cedar Park, 
and Round Rock out or north of, northish, north of Texas. So cities are growing to accommodate more and more people, increasing the amount of space and resources that are used. Uh, cities break up the environment by buildings and houses and roads, and that makes it a little difficult for wildlife to move around and locate places that they prefer to live. Uh, this term is, can also be referenced to uh, habitat fragmentation. Uh, so looking at this picture here, you can see this road that's kind of dividing this really pretty forestry looking area. Uh, and you can tell that's kind of difficult for animals to safely cross. Uh, some natural park or national parks uh, preserved areas might have something called a wildlife corridor. It looks like a bridge, but it also has vegetation and it passes straight over the road so that it can allow for animals to safely move across the street. But with that, cities can also be loud and bright and dangerous. However, some animals uh, live successfully in them. So these wildlife are this, these animals are defined as urban wildlife. <laughs> so before we get into the nitty gritty, I guess, of why some animals can live in urban areas better than others, let's talk about mammals because this presentation is about urban mammals, right? So we talked a little bit about what urban wildlife is, but specifically, what do you think a mammal is? Uh, so put little comments in the chat. What do you think mammals are? Okay. If anyone said animals, that would be correct. <laughs> So mammals are part of the animal kingdom. They're also chordates, which is um, an interesting word, but it includes a, most, or it's largely part vertebrate animals, which means animals that have backbones. You may notice this uh, spine here because we also have backbones. And vertebrates include fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So some characteristics of mammals we can think of, if you have already have some in your mind and you wanna put them in the chat, you can do that too. I'd like to see some of your answers. Uh, I'll wait a little second. So some things that uh, you might be already typing into the chat may actually not be exclusively, or may not be exclusive to mammals. So being warm-blooded warm -blooded or endothermic, which means that we can generate our own body heat in comparison to reptiles and fish and amphibians that are ectothermic, they rely on their surrounding environments for warmth. Um, however, birds are also warm-blooded and mammals also aren't the only ones with four chambered hearts. Birds and crocodiles have four chambered hearts. And some snakes actually give birth to live young as well as platypuses also are mammals that lay eggs. So there's some outliers in there to giving uh, live birth. And these traits are a little more unique to mammals. So having fur, sweat glands, or fur on most of the body, uh, sweat glands, and they have specialty mammary or specialty sweat glands that produce milk for young that are called mammary, mammary glands. Um, I know that there's something I just learned re uh, recently, something called crop milk or pigeon milk. Um, it's not, produced by mammary glands in pigeons. It's produced with uh, secretions from the crop, this area in birds that stores food. So it's not exactly the same as with mammary glands. And then also something that is a little more unique to mammals is three middle ear bones. So there's these three little bones between your eardrum and the, your inner ear. Um, it's a piece called, or a part called the cochlea. 
Um, and these little bones help amplify sound and enhance hearing for mammals. Uh, whereas I think birds only have one middle ear bone. So we talked a little bit about what mammals are. And so it's easy to apply that definition of a mammal to add together urban wildlife and urban mammals. So mammals that live well in cities, urban areas are can be considered urban mammals. So let's jump into some common urban mammals in Texas. Um, and if you already know some, you can go ahead and put them in the chat too. We'll start off with rodents, but I actually want to play a little game first. So I'm going to display three animals on the screen and you have to tell me which one is a rodent. So we have three different mammals here. We have a fox squirrel. We have Eastern Cottontail, and we have a Striped Skunk. So you have to pick A, B, or C. Which one of these do you think is a rodent? If you guessed A, the fox squirrel, then that would be correct. Um, rabbits aren't actually rodents and skunks are not rodents. So rodents are small mammals that include mice, rats, squirrels, porcupines, gophers, and beavers, but not rabbits and not skunks. Uh, so they're known for, and you probably already know, these continuously growing uh, front teeth in the top and bottom of their mouths and they eat mostly vegetation. So one common rodent in particular is the fox squirrel that you may see around Texas. Um, if you're on campus at UT, there's plenty of these squirrels. Um, there's actually a whole Instagram account and a book now dedicated to all the different fox squirrels we have here on campus. Um, I think it's just called Squirrels of UT Austin. It's really cute and I look at it often. <laughs> Moving on to rabbits. Rabbits are also small and have some characteristics that are similar to rodents, but with their continuously, with the two front teeth, their front teeth on the top and the bottom, there's also an additional pair of teeth underneath their front two teeth. Uh, they're smaller teeth, but it's like having two sets of teeth in the front and the back. Uh, they also feed on vegetation and jackrabbits are actually hares, so they are a bit different physically having long ears. If you've ever seen a jackrabbit, I probably should have included a picture of one. Um, and they also have different uh, nesting characteristics. So for something like a cottontail rabbit, an eastern cottontail rabbit, something that's very common in urban areas um, here in Texas. Eastern cottontail rabbits have very small hairless babies that need nice cushy nest, uh, nice cushy nest that's warm. Uh, Jackrabbits actually give birth to um, fully furred babies and they can open their eyes relatively soon after birth. Uh, they don't spend a lot or as much time in the nest. Uh, so for some common carnivores that we have here in Texas, first of all, we'll discuss what carnivores are and they consume flesh, but um, some of these that I mentioned, ex especially the coyote, actually do eat vegetation seasonally, depending on the season and the environment. Uh, some of these urban carnivores you might have already seen or heard of. So a coyote, uh, gray foxes, there are actually three foxes in Texas, the kit fox, the red fox, and the gray fox, but the gray fox is the most common. 
Uh, there's also bobcats, raccoons, you've probably seen plenty of raccoons in your trash, uh, and striped skunks. So there are actually five kinds of skunks in Texas, which is quite a bit for one state. Um, and the most common skunk you'll see will be the one that I have listed here. Uh, it's a striped skunk. The one that you may be least likely to find in an urban area would be the hooded skunk, um, unless if you're in like the Big Bend area of Texas. Uh, moving on to marsupials, or one specifically, uh, the Virginia possum. So these are cat-sized mammals. You've probably seen them around also not too far away from trash cans. Uh, they're the only marsupial in North America, and marsupials have very small, uh, underdeveloped young. And they're born that way and they mature outside in pouches that their mothers have um, that also allow for them to drink milk and spend a lot of their development inside the pouches rather than inside mom's body. Uh, they consume small animals, dead animals, insects, uh, veggies, and trash. And they have prehensile tails so they can hang off of trees, you might see some hanging upside down. So you may have noticed on some slides, or mostly at this point, the slides say opossum with an O in front. And uh, I say possum. But did you know that there's actually a difference between an opossum and a possum? So this is what I say and what most Americans say when they see a possum. We see this Virginia opossum. But in Australia, they have another uh, set of marsupials that are actually called possums. So they're not actually the same animal. Uh, for example, possums are a bit larger in body size. So as I mentioned before, they're about the size of a house cat. Uh, possums have fur on their tails while opossums are naked and hairless. And you can see a little bit, I tried to find um, a picture where you can look at the tail of the Virginia opossum. You can see it's very pinky. There's actually uh, no hair on the tail versus the possum on the right of the screen, you can see they have bushy tails, uh, hence the name brush tail. So they're actually two different animals, but going throughout the presentation, I will probably still mindlessly say possum, fully meaning the Virginia possum because that's the marsupial I'm talking about in North America. So we've talked a little bit about what urban mammals are and we've identified some common ones. So what's the draw to living in cities? I mentioned before that they can be kind of loud. There's, they can be bright at night because of the lighting and it can be a bit dangerous with all the cars and everything around. Uh, why do you think a mammal or any animal really would want to live in a city? I just give a little second to think about it before I show you the next slide. So if, the, if your answer or one of your answers was food, um, that's a really big reason why mammals may want to live in urban areas. So we have waste, our food scraps and trash, compost, uh, crumbs from outdoor eating areas. We've been all eating outdoors a bit more often lately. So you might notice uh, lots of things kind of hovering around looking for scraps to eat, especially squirrels, especially birds. Uh, there may be supplemental feeding. So you may have a bird feeder in your yard, uh, cat food and dog food for outdoor pets or water fountains that could be a water source for urban mammals. Uh, they can also consume plants. So if you have a garden, there might be some tasty things that 
they would like to eat uh, some fruit producing shrubs and trees and grassy lawns and also other organisms. So there's other small animals. We've mentioned some small mammals, some rodents. Um, you might notice some house mice and some Norwegian rats. Also here in Texas, um, they like to live in buildings and some animals like to eat those. Uh, also birds and non-living animals like roadkill and insects. So another reason that animals may want to live in cities is for shelter and protection. So they can provide access to shelter from weather and harsh environmental conditions from predation. Um, and for example, some places that mammals may live are in dens abandoned by other animals that are located in buildings or under buildings um, and possibly under trees or fallen trees. Also under patios, houses and sheds, um, possibly not someone's favorite place for them to live. Uh, in trees and vehicles, uh, I say vehicles because sometimes you might find rodents or uh, kittens, uh, dumpsters, I mentioned before, animals like to be cleared um, near proximity to dumpsters or areas with a lot of trash. And so many other places, so many little pockets in buildings. Um, I'm, there's also something online, a blog called Living in the City. And they have this really cool series where people submit pictures with wildlife in weird places. There is one with like a mountain lion on a car, which was really interesting. Um, dens in really weird places. So an example, uh, which is shown by this kitten here. I didn't take this picture, but it goes along with this story. Uh, I found my husband and I found a feral kitten under our shed last year and it did not want to come out. So uh, we went and got a trap and some really nice smelly food to lure the kitten out. And we brought it over to our local animal shelter so that it had the opportunity to be adopted as an indoor cat. And another example, is this skunk family living under a patio. Uh, this video was, is from the Gates Animal Control Company. So they're featured on National Geographic, but they found this skunk family under a patio and they have some really cool and interesting information. I received a call from a customer regarding a skunk living underneath the stairs of this front porch. As I placed my camera underneath, I could see an adult skunk sitting on a grass nest. Our first objective is to get the skunk to get off of the nest so that we can see if there's babies. I use my fiberglass rod to gently probe under the nest to see if I can get her to move off. She's reluctant at first. but moves forward to sniff the rod and then decides to move away, revealing a number of babies inside the nest. It is amazing how cute they are when you consider how bad they can smell. The white markings on the babies can vary from skunk to skunk, but this baby is an identical replica of his mother. Eventually, curiosity got the better of this baby skunk as he decided to venture towards the camera and the bright light at the entrance hole. The mother keeps a watchful eye on his movements. After falling just before the lens, the mother decides that enough is enough, moves in, grabs him by the scruff of the neck, and drags him back to the nest. While performing this job, I was amazed on how calm the mother remained. 
You can see her grooming the baby's tail while I'm only just a few feet away from her. No other species that we deal with would do this in the presence of humans. Um, so that was a very cute example. Hopefully uh, everyone is able to hear that since there was sound. Um, and this next example that I have doesn't have sound. So instead, I will tell you here. Here we go. So this one is a possum coming out of a den uh, provided by the National or the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of facts while you watch this one come out. So possums have lower body temperatures and a really nice successful immune system. So it's not very common for them to carry rabies. Uh, they can eat up to 5,000 ticks per season. They eat around 90 to 95% of the ticks that are on their bodies. And my favorite part is this nice stretch and little itch behind the ears. They also have um, naked ears. They don't have any hair on their ears. Okay. So now let's get back to that idea and the thought of why some species may live in cities better than others. Uh, it turns out that this can be a complicated question. We don't really know a lot about the general drivers of uh, urban adaptation to environments like this, uh, but as urban areas expand, we're expecting to see more urban mammals and we're expecting to interact with them more. So there are a couple of traits that scientists uh, have somewhat agreed on that may make it easier for animals to adjust to urban environments. Uh, one is that generalists tend to do well in cities. So an animal that is a generalist has broad food and environmental requirements. Uh, so they have a very wide range of food that they can eat. Uh, for example, the raccoon, the raccoon can eat a lot of different uh, small mammals, eggs, all sorts of different things uh, in an urban environment. And they're also able to adapt to changing environments a little bit better. Uh, specialists, like for example, this koala here, have a narrow range of food and environmental requirements. Uh, they're typically a little, they have a harder time adjusting to changes. So if you know already, uh, koalas mostly only feed on eucalyptus leaves and so that doesn't leave a lot of room to eat or survive on anything else. And cities don't necessarily provide that. So a example of a specialist is a koala. Uh, another characteristic or trait um, you, is body size. So you might see more squirrels, smaller mammals and um, rodents and things in cities compared to something as big as a moose, right? Uh, there's a lot less space for a moose to move around comfortably compared to a squirrel. Uh, so what other factors may be associated with occupying cities? Um, there's a study in Ecology Letters from 2019, a group that sought out some more of these factors in 190 urban mammals. So this graph here is just a picture uh, showing all the different animals that are included in this study. So this bottom part here with all of the names are names of groups of animals. So Chiroptera is a group representing bats. Uh, you can see carnivora. We talked about carnivores earlier and rodents, primates, uh, and so on down to marsupials. Uh, and the findings were that overall mammals seem to be most successful in areas that have, uh, not in areas, in urban areas that have large litter sizes. So mammals that have large litter sizes, which means that they can have a lot of babies at one time. Um, other factors that were important ended up being important for some groups, but not all of them. 
So for example, for carnivores, a larger brain size, a larger body size, greater diversity, and later weaning age made it more likely for them to either, actually, let me go back so I could show you the different colors because the colors do have significance. So the colors are representing the portion of species or the number of animals that may be visitors, represented by green, visitors and dwellers, or just dwellers. So dwellers are animals that frequent or actually live as in dwell in urban areas. So they're looking at these different factors and different traits relating to all of these animals to see uh, which ones would which factors would be best for them, for urban mammals to persist or live successfully in urban areas. Uh, so going back to the carnivores, so larger brain size, larger body size, and greater diet diversity and larger weeding were associated with occupying cities. Uh, ungulates, for ungulates, it's earlier weaning age, and ungulate is a hooved animal like a deer. So earlier weaning age as compared to later weaning age is important for ungulates to occupy cities. For rodents, a uh, larger brain size, larger body size, greater diet diversity, and later weaning. And for bats, higher dispersal ability as in uh, ability to disperse seeds. Um, and for primates, larger brain size, larger body size also a greater diversity in diet and earlier weaning age. It's also important to know that uh, cities are not made exactly the same. So they may differ in the density of people. So how many people live in a given area, how many houses may live in a given area, how those houses or buildings are arranged and the amount of green space and geographic location. So all of these things may alter how resources are distributed and what resources are made available to wildlife. So some of the common mammals that I mentioned above, though they're pretty common in a lot of cities, they may not be as common or have um, as many individuals because of these particular characteristics. So for example, Austin is densely packed. There's a lot of buildings. There's a lot of people living in a small area um, compared to Iowa City. Uh, it's a bit more spread out and has a bit less people. You may find that some mammals that you see in Austin, Texas, you may not exactly see in, in Iowa City. So while I say that these are common mammals, there's some fluctuation to what you see and how many you see. So after talking about all of this, why should we think about wildlife in cities? Why should we care? So urban areas are still considered habitat. So maintaining and creating a healthy environment means a healthy place for humans to live and animals to live. So this is a common triad uh, used in something called One Health, which is a concept that human health, environmental health, and animal health contribute to overall health. Uh, another thing to consider is that these animals that I mentioned before provide something called ecosystem services. So many mammals take on the role of dispersing seeds. Uh, bats consume a lot of insects like moths and mosquitoes, which is great because that is not a job that I am willing to do. Uh, possums eat ticks, like I mentioned before, but also cockroaches and rats and dead animals. Uh, they're also a gardener's best friend because they like to eat slugs and snails. Not my favorite thing to see in my garden. Um, and coyotes, they consume mice and rats that may they carry diseases of zoonotic potential. I know this presentation doesn't care or doesn't have a lot of information on urban mammals and diseases, but uh, that was a tidbit that I really wanted to include. 
So all of these positive contributions that I've just listed from these three examples, and there's many, many more, are called ecosystem services. Another benefit is that humans, like human mental health and well-being benefit from interacting with wildlife and nature. So considering that so many of us live in cities, it's not really a surprise that a lot of our interactions with animals and the environment are within cities. So parks and natural areas that are provided, uh, walking around your neighborhood, you'll see things and enjoy being outside maybe. And you may know from experience yourself, just knowing how you feel being outside or getting time outside. Uh, for example, if you had the chance to see Mexican free tailed bats emerge, uh, in Austin, I think it's the Congress Bridge. I unfortunately haven't had the chance to see them. So um, I'd love to know your experience, but if you remember how that feels, you might have a nice feeling of euphoria. Um, and if not, maybe there's other experiences like hearing coyotes at night. Um, and you may also have a bird feeder because you enjoy seeing birds in your yard or growing beneficial plants and insects to attract different uh, animals that you want to see in your garden or in your yard. And another thing to consider is human wildlife conflict. So with increasing movement of people to urban areas, we're expecting conflict between humans and wildlife to increase. So some of these things are just examples and I'm sure that you can also think of some too, like getting into the garden. Uh, my grandma back home in Arizona mentioned recently that some javelinas came and ate, their, or ate her pepper and tomato plants. Um, living somewhere inconvenient, like I mentioned before, living in dens under patios and sheds and things may not be the most convenient place to have some mammals living near you. Uh, our pets may have negative interactions with wildlife and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, car accidents, so it's, it's never fun to hit an animal while you're driving and um, it can also be dangerous to hit an animal. You may swerve um, and especially something as large as a deer, it can be very dangerous. Another thing is destruction of property. So I mentioned rats before, uh, commonly, you may see them tear up things or chew through things if you find that you have any rodents in your house. So it's important to know more about the urban wildlife so we can reduce these negative interactions. Uh, for domestic pets and wildlife and their interactions, uh, specifically cats and dogs, uh, many animals are brought into wildlife rehabilitation centers that are injured by cats or dogs. Uh, so your dog may, might, may find something running around in the backyard and was able to catch it, or your cat may have decided to bring you a present. Um, but it's estimated that three, uh, three free roaming domestic cats kill 6 to 6.3 to 22.3 billion mammals per year. And this is separate from birds that are killed annually in the United States. There's not as many, uh, there's not as much information relating to dog attacks in mammals in the United States specifically, but for cats, there seems to, there seems to be a pretty decent chunk of mammals and birds that are killed in urban areas, some of which may actually be uh, endangered or not as common to find. Uh, so what can we do to protect urban wildlife? So one thing is to cover and pick up trash. Uh, consider the placement of bird feeders. Um, if you've ever seen the videos by uh, Mark Roberg, some kids might know who that is. He's a ex um, NASA or former NASA engineer. He made an entire video on how tricky it can be to place uh, uh, bird feeders in a way that squirrels can't get to them. It's a really entertaining video, so that may be something to watch after this. Um, 
Something else to consider is keeping your cats indoors at least at night or having some sort of bell on them because it may alert whatever animal they might try to catch. Um, and keeping your dogs on leashes when indicated. So you'll see places in parks that have a lot of uh, signs that may say that if they allow dogs, they should only be on leash. This is particularly a, a, one of the reasons why they recommend that. Um, obviously in dog parks and other things that where it's okay to have your dogs off leash your backyard and things. Um, but in places where there's indication that they should have them on leash, uh, please keep them on leash. And uh, watch and observe from a distance. So it's really cool to see mammals and things around you, uh, but watching at a distance can reduce stress to animals. You can take pictures sometimes, um, maybe at night with a flash, it might scare them a little bit. Um, and if you find any injured, or orphan wildlife contact a local wildlife rescue. Um, and for feeding wildlife, I think that there's still a city ordinance in Austin uh, prohibiting people from feeding deer. So purposely feeding deer uh, can lead to a little bit of trouble. Uh, so what we eat is also not something that animals are intended to eat and aren't necessarily nutritious to them, right? There are some things that we eat that aren't very nutritious to them and also aren't very nutritious to us. Uh, feeding like this can increase human wildlife conflict. So you saw that picture before with the cat and the many raccoons on the other side looking into this empty container. Sometimes it attracts more wildlife to your yard. Um, this can also make animals sick. So eating things that end up not being food items like pieces of trash, lids to bottles and other things could make animals sick or really rotten foods. Um, and it may attract mammals to busy roads, which could increase uh, roadkill incidents. So when you have when you find or if you find a injured or potentially orphaned mammal, um, it's really important to make sure that you don't feed or give them water right away. If you can, observe from a distance and look at the condition of the animal first. So this Austin Wildlife Rescue uh, diagram here is a really nice flow chart that gives you some things to consider before intervening because oftentimes you may not need to. Sometimes mom plans on coming back and realizes that the baby is gone and mom takes care of it from there. Um, so it's important to consider these things and this is on the Austin Wildlife Rescue uh, website. So if you do find something you're not exactly sure what to do, um, I recommend going through this. There's also one for birds as well. And of course, if you're ever in doubt about what to do, uh, call your local wildlife rescue. So in Austin, we have the Austin Wildlife Rescue. In the Georgetown Round Rock area, there's All Things Wild Rehabilitation and Austin Bat Refuge if you find some bats. Uh, I know in Tucson, the place that I volunteered at for my family in Arizona is called All Things Wild. I think that they're mostly an avian sanctuary now, so they mostly care for birds, but they would still give you advice on what to do with mammals. Um, and thank you. I don't know if you can hear that clapping, that clapping, Brianna, but I was. <laughs> thank you. I was. Uh, I right. might um, put it back to the slide if other people want more information or they want to read that slide again. Excellent. Excellent. No worries. That's a really good idea. Um, we'll open it up for questions. If anybody has anything they'd like to ask, please go ahead and type it into the chat and we will relay it to Brianna. I did forget to mention that at the beginning, so it might take a second for a few of them to get typed up. Oh boy, starting slow. All right, favorite urban mammal? Oh, uh, possum by far. I probably <laughs> included 
a disproportionate amount of facts about possums compared to everything else I included in this. Because of their functionality or because you think they're adorable? Um, I think it's a mixture of things. I personally think that they are very cute <laughs> and their babies are very cute. Um, I love the prehensile tails. Uh, there's tons of cute pictures of babies hanging from trees. It's just really cute. Um, and the whole thing about rabies that just really fascinates me. Nice. Do you have any comments or thoughts about observing urban mammals at night? I, I'm assuming this is how can we better observe urban animals at night? Um, I'm not sure if I have any, any really good advice. I think that phones nowadays actually have some interesting night mode capabilities. Um, I know that's more of a an accessibility thing, but I think that since some phones, like my phone has that, and I've been able to take some um, pictures of frogs and things decently. So, and I'm sure that there's other cameras that actually have night mode capabilities to reduce using flash. Okay, so we want you. How can we? How can we get closer, or how, not necessarily closer? I guess the idea is, uh, what are some tips for being able to actually see some animals at night? Um, I guess it would be to consider timing. So depending on what kinds of mammals that you'd want to see, some are nocturnal, some are pretty active between like nighttime before the sun rises and after the sun rises. Um, I think that my best advice is just deciding or looking into what mammals you're interested in seeing, um, particular locations that you may find them often, and the time of day. All right, cool. Oh, this would be interesting. So bats use echolocation. How do you presume that they would navigate a noisy city? Um, I think... I think that I actually read something about the frequency of calls and things being different in urban areas. Um, I'm not entirely sure how they are the mechanisms or how they are actually able to uh, find bugs and echolocate with noisy cars and things. Um, but I think that's a really good question. Cool. Yeah, actually, they, they do they do it pretty successfully. They're able to to paint, outline and, and paint the insects really well, and they can modulate the frequency of their echolocation call, which is super awesome too. So how would we handle a bat or other mammal that might carry rabies or other zoonotic diseases? Uh, one thing I would recommend is, at least for bats, something that I saw is if they happen to fly into your house, one thing that you can do is close all of the doors inside your house, unless if it's leading outside. So if you open a door that's leading outside and windows that are leading outside, um, the bat will likely leave. And it, I think that's a good thing to try before actually trying to catch or touch them. Um, any mammals that you may find where you feel like you need to handle them, always, always wear gloves. And I would recommend again with this slide, any of these great wildlife rescues, Austin Bat Refuge has a lot of information and resources about dealing with bats specifically. And of course, if there's any chance that you get bit by something, I advise immediately seeking medical care. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's called just animal control right away, right? Ooh, so some urban animals have been in cities for a long time. So we've had our urban mammals, they've been around for a while. Do you, have they been around so long that they might differ from their rural brethren or counterparts? Um, there's actually quite a bit of examples. I don't know about differences genetically, but um, some things in behavior like with raccoons, there's this big viral video in Canada about how well they were able to figure out how to open these like fancy trash cans. They found ways to knock them over and bust them over. Um, they seem to be really quick to change their behaviors to live well in cities and get that extra tasty award of whatever is in that trash. So I, I definitely think that there are some differences. I think in possums, 
They, uh, in urban areas, differ in body mass, probably because of all of the food around and resources around compared to urban possums. Very cool. I know there's differences epigenetically between some populations, but that's only in salamanders that I'm aware of. Yeah, there's a lot of information on that for birds and lizards and things, but mammals are pretty understudied. All right. All right. Oh, cool. This will be a two-parter. So uh, in your opinion, and based on what you've seen and read, uh, what mammal is the most adaptable? And then once you've done that, can you talk to us a little bit more about your research on disease in mammals? Okay, uh, so for the first question, I would probably say raccoons. They're excellent climbers. Um, and the reasons that I mentioned before about how quick they are to learn about getting into things, I think that makes them one of the more and maybe most adaptable mammals. They can eat so many things uh, so it makes it easier for them to get around in this city with our little grabby hands. Um, it makes it easier because they can eat so many different things and then their quick behavior changes. Um, and my research, um, I'm currently interested in studying flea-borne diseases, um, specifically murine typhus. Here in Texas, it's an endemic flea-borne disease a uh, bacterial infection that was, it used to be maintained in a rodent flea cycle, but is now after uh, years and years of rodent control and DDT um, has somehow shifted to a cycle, a paradomestic cycle that includes feral cats, possums, um, and some other mammals like dogs. And so they have these fleas, they get uh, bit by fleas and infected and humans can come in contact with those infected fleas and also become infected with flea-borne typhus. Um, they have, for people, they have, for symptoms, it's more flu-like, so it's, it's a bit under-diagnosed without actual, without proper testing or proper diagnostics. Um, but I think that it's really interesting that shift in uh, rodents to this cycle that includes possums. Um, and some other flea-borne diseases like Bartonella, um, I'm also interested in understanding infection in possums in urban environments versus rural environments. Um, something that I'm not studying directly, but I'm interested in also is Chagas disease uh, here in Texas. Uh, possums are also involved in the transmission of Chagas disease, or they're hosts of the of the insect vectors. That's really cool. That's really cool. Let's see. Oh, so this might come out of left field. So earlier this week, there was a loose tiger in Houston, and there's only a few real details surrounding it. But do you have any thoughts on the matter? Um, I. Actually, this is very new news to me, so I'm definitely looking this up later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, it sounds like an interesting uh, event, possibly scary for people in Houston, I imagine. It just in, in case people are wondering, the, the quick and dirty of it is um, a tiger got loose and an undercover cop was approaching it to shoot it, and some random person showed up in a pickup truck grabbed the tiger, put it in his truck, fled off. They chased him down. It wasn't the guy's tiger, but he was wanted for murder. So they brought him in anyway. And then they had, don't know where the tiger is as far as I know. So that's a fun little story from Houston. And they don't know where it came from still? Nope. And by the time the cops caught up to the guy, the tiger had gotten loose or left or whatever. Wow. I'd say just call animal control. I'm not messing with the tiger. <laughs> I would not recommend handling or being near uh, a tiger. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. 
All right, well, Brianna, thank you very much for coming out to us and talking about urban mammals. Um, it was a pleasure. Uh, give you another round of applause from me, at least. That's wonderful. Thank you. It's and been a while thank- since I've talked. So. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels good to actually like have a conversation, right? Yeah, it does. It really does. Uh, thank you, everyone. Well, thank coming. you again for coming out. And again, everybody, this is our last talk for the semester. We'll see you all in the fall and hopefully in person. Everybody have a nice day. Good night, everybody. Have a good weekend.